Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to a bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Today is August 14, 2015, the 250th anniversary of the first Boston Stamp Act riot. As you know, tomorrow I will lead a tour of Boston with an emphasis on these Stamp Act riots. But I know you couldn't make it, and I didn't want you to miss out. So I sat down with an expert on the Boston Stamp Act riots to create this bonus episode for you. It is an episode that explores the Stamp Act and the Boston riots around it with J.L. Bell, proprietor of Boston1775.net a well-known and well-established blog about all things revolutionary New England. During our chat, John reveals details about the American Revenue Act of 1764, better known as the Sugar Act or the act that came before the Stamp Act, why Parliament passed the Sugar and Stamp Acts, and details about the Boston Stamp Act riots and how they influenced the course of the American Revolution in Boston, and throughout the 13 colonies. Are you ready to join the mob? Let's meet our guide, J.L. Bell. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today's guest is a writer specializing in the history of the American Revolution in New England. He is the proprietor of a daily blog at boston1775.net, which promises history, analysis, and unabashed gossip. His writings in print include a chapter on the political activities of Boston's youth in the book Children in Colonial America and a book-length study of General George Washington in Cambridge for the National Park Service. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, J.L. Bell. Thanks very much, Liz. If you have never visited John's blog, you are truly missing out. Nearly every day, there is a post that goes into the nitty-gritty details of New English life during the American Revolution. Sometimes posts explore the origins of a phrase or the realities of a story, like the origins of the phrase, no taxation without representation. And yet, still on other days, John's posts reveal something fascinating about something that seems so mundane, just like a plain object or an issue. So, John... Now that we have you all to ourselves, would you tell us what inspired you to start Boston1775.net and what keeps you inspired to keep investigating nearly all aspects of new English life during the American Revolution? Well, that's a question about history that goes back into my history. I grew up in Middlesex County, Massachusetts during the Bicentennial and I was in fifth grade when that happened, 75, 76, that year. And in fifth grade in Massachusetts, the curriculum calls for studying colonial and revolutionary history. So I was getting this triple dose of the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very interesting, somewhat inspiring. I also thought that Clearly, it had been studied to death because it was such an important part of regional and national history. So I was very surprised uh, when I was making a career change in the late 90s to read a biography of Samuel Adams just for recreation, and I came across stories that I hadn't heard before. It's quite possible that they had been told to me growing up in uh, Middlesex County, Massachusetts, but I just hadn't paid attention. But I realized with that that there were more stories to be found out, and so I started to research them on my own. I happened to be doing that at a time when the Internet was making it much easier to find sources, to find what libraries in the area had the right books. It was before Google Books, but there was already material coming online. And I happened to be uh, lucky enough to put together some sources to find some stories that had not been told before and started to publish those. That was around 2000, 2001. 
I continued doing research. I continued talking at various historic sites and publishing articles and papers. But there were these little things, little stories that didn't have, it seemed, enough weight to stand on their own as an article. And yet I wanted to share them with the world. So I started looking around for a way to do that with a website. At the time, it felt like the only way to have a website, you'd have to put everything out at once. And then every time you had to make a change, you had to go to your webmaster, who is usually your neighbor or your nephew, and he's 16-year-old, and he's named Jeremy. And you say, Jeremy, can you do this? And he has tennis practice or whatever. And then a friend told me about how blogs work. And I realized that a blog would be a way to dribble out these stories that I had or other things that came up or thoughts, and it wouldn't need to be complete all the way, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't need to go through another person. I could just wake up in the morning and decide, hmm, what am I interested in writing about today? So I started doing that in May 2006, and I've been doing it every day since. I may have been better off back then realizing that a blog didn't actually have to be daily, but once I got into that habit, it is daily, seven days a week, and I, through judicious backfilling, have not missed a day. Yeah, I'm in awe of all the content you put out on your blog. And your remarks, you mentioned you read a book about Samuel Adams. And knowing your blog and knowing how well you research things, I wonder, John, is he Samuel or Sam? There are a couple of occasional references to him in the period as Sam, but most people on both sides of the political divide call him Samuel Adams, Mr. Samuel Adams. In the 20th century, uh, image of him as a rabble rouser, or a very radical uh, person basically based on you know, communists and anarchists, developed and was the principal image of him in the popular imagination. We can see that in books like the, the children's novel, Mr. Revere and I. But in fact, he was a gentleman. He had a master's degree from Harvard. He was a very devout man. He was from the merchant genteel class. He did not spend a lot on clothing, to be sure, but he lived in a genteel style. And so he was not the you know, easy, uh, comradely friend of the working man Sam, good old Sam Adams with his beer mugs, which is presently the most widespread image of Samuel Adams. John, I could pepper you with all sorts of different questions about New England, but I'm going to have to leave those because I invited you on the show to talk about the Stamp Act. 2015 marks the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act. And earlier this year, John began posting details about the act, its passage and colonial resistance to it. John, I think before we dive into the Stamp Act, and I know that's become an area of expertise, I think we really should talk about the American Revenue Act of 1764, the act before the Stamp Act. Would you tell us about this act that we know today as the Sugar and Molasses Act and how colonists responded to it? The Sugar and Molasses Act of 1764 was, or the Sugar Act, was the way that Parliament first devised to raise revenue in the colonies to administer the colonies. There had been previous acts regulating the trade of molasses or sugar in the British Empire. Trying, It was based on a mercantilist system, so they were trying to keep out the raw products of French and Dutch and Spanish colonies and keep all the wealth of the British Empire within the British Empire. The sugar was made from sugar cane in the Caribbean and then shipped up to New England where it was distilled into rum, or the molasses was distilled, in, distilled into rum and into sugar. By adding more enforcement in 1764 and by explicitly saying that the revenue from these tariffs would now go towards administering the costs of the empire in North America, Parliament was doing something new. There had been a sugar tax or a molasses tax before, but it hadn't been so strictly enforced, and it had been at least nominally supposed to just keep the trade within the empire. In 1764, Parliament was actually saying, no, we actually want to raise money this way from the colonists and then to spend it according to our priorities. This was the first time that Parliament had been explicit about that, and there was a great deal of reaction to that, or objections and complaints but only really within the 
industry that was affected, the sugar traders, the molasses traders, the rum distilleries of New England. They were already somewhat under pressure, as I understand it. The Caribbean planters were realizing that they could distill the molasses into rum themselves, and that's why we have Jamaican rum and Cuban rum instead of you know, Massachusetts rum these days. And so the sugar slash molasses slash rum business, that interest in New England was actually starting to fade. It was really a special interest, and it did not, while those merchants complained, they did not get the traction that they would have needed to actually overturn that act. Was it the fact that the colonists didn't really protest the Revenue Act, the reason why Parliament passed the Stamp Act? I think that there was a fair amount of protest, but it wasn't widespread. And then, indeed, the same government in London under George Granville, the first minister, they did propose this Stamp Act in starting in 1764. And one of the first things they did is they asked the colonial governments what they thought. And the colonial governments all said, no, this is a terrible idea. And yet, as George Granville said when he introduced the bill into Parliament, none of them provided an alternative way for Parliament to raise revenue to the level needed to administer the colonies. So he went ahead with the law. And yes, he probably did think that it would, that the new Stamp Act would gain some objections, but it would eventually take hold. In Britain, there had been a Stamp Act for decades, since I think 1712 or so. In fact, in, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts legislature instituted a Stamp Act for a couple of years in the 1750s when it needed to raise money for the possibility of war with France. So in principle, a Stamp Act seemed to be within the constitution of the British Empire. Massachusetts wasn't the only colony because I've seen it in the record books of New York, too. In fact, I saw Stamp Act during the French and Indian War. I was kind of floored because there's such a negative reaction to the Stamp Act that Parliament passes after the French and Indian War. So I was like, wow. Yeah. They had experience with a Stamp Act, and then the one that Parliament passes is is just no good. And that's all because it's Parliament. It's not it truly is an issue of taxation without representation. It truly is an issue that this legislature, which the colonists had no say over, was choosing how to tax the colonists and choosing how to spend that money. Why did Parliament pass the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act? Why does it need to raise money from the colonies? That's a good question, and it gets to imperial policy overall. The preamble to the Stamp Act is explicit that it's supposed to defer the costs of administering the empire in America, which had grown much larger with the addition of France's mainland colonies, uh, that huge territory of Canada and Quebec. Also, there was now a much there was less pressure against moving to the West, and yet from the imperial government's standards, they needed to reward and protect their Native American allies who would be coming into conflict with European settlers moving west. So that was one new element of administration, putting out fortifications and army outposts along the frontier to try to keep the peace there. But there also seems to have been a conviction within the London government that they really needed to be more involved in colonial administration, that it wasn't good enough to just let these colonies survive on their own, or not survive in some cases. They needed to be more integrated into the British government, into the British system, and that in turn meant more administration, and this was simply not something that the British colonists were used to. Earlier, you mentioned the phrase, no taxation without representation. I know from reading your blog that you have researched the origins of this term. Does that term come about because of the Stamp Act protests? It does not come about directly. The idea that British subjects, of whether in the mainland or in the colonies, should not be taxed except by a legislature that they had somehow been represented in, that is an older idea that, for instance, James Otis wrote about in one of his pamphlets against the Sugar Act in 1764. So the idea predates the Stamp Act. But 
After the Stamp Act was repealed, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, Parliament then debated and passed what they called the Declaratory Act, which basically says, okay, we're taking back the stamp tax, but we were right all along in principle about being able to tax the colonies. That's what they were declaring. During that debate, a friend of the American colonies named Lord Camden in the House of Lords brought up the principle of the British Parliament not being able to tax the colonies because the colonists didn't vote for anybody or weren't represented in Parliament. Nobody in London accepted this idea, but his arguments were then published a couple of years later in various British magazines, one of them being called the London Magazine. And in that magazine, at the top of the page, where what we call the running head in Microsoft Word, there was a summary of his argument, which was no taxation without representation, period. And that is the earliest use of the phrase, that nice, succinct, rhyming phrase that we're all so used to. I have not been able to find any previous author using those words. How do you conduct a search for the earliest use of a term or a phrase like no taxation without representation? The fact that you found it in this magazine on the letterhead is, is amazing. It is all due to Google. Google Books is simply a conspiracy to make sure that I never stand up from my desk again. With their keyword search, it is, and manipulation, it's not, you know, it's hard to sort out the dates and things like that, but that's where I first go now to look at for phrases. And I've been lucky, and it's great that there is such a, a large database there, and so I'm eternally grateful to that great corporation. What have your Google searches or your archival searches turned up on the Liberty Tree? Because the Stamp Act riot in Boston really starts at the Liberty Tree. So I wonder if you could tell us what you know about the Liberty Tree and how it became a symbol of colonial resistance to parliamentary taxation. Okay. Well, to start with, something that we can see looking at period sources is that the tree was called Liberty Tree, not the Liberty Tree sometimes the Tree of Liberty, but for some reason they only called it Liberty Tree, often with a hyphen. When they first had the Stamp Act protest there in August of 1765, when Bostonians first did it, the tree wasn't even named that way. It was uh, simply a very large tree right beside the road as you came into the town, and the town was a peninsula, a sort of tadpole-shaped peninsula, uh, sticking off of Massachusetts at the time. So there was only one road into town. If you were bringing in your goods to market, you had to go along that road. And so it was a very good, this big tree was a landmark for people coming into town. It's a very good place to hang effigies if you wanted to hang effigies to show your displeasure with somebody. And that's what was done on August 14, 1765. That protest, and we can talk more about its details, but that evening, it became violent. And then a couple of weeks later, there was an even more violent protest, which ended up with a sacking of the lieutenant governor's house. And at that point, it looks like the town fathers and the political organizers of Boston decided that they needed to tame this energy, this political rancor that they had helped to ignite. And part of what they were doing, it looks like, is they went back to that first protest on August 14th and the daytime protest, which was peaceful, and they tried to elevate that to being the most important and admirable. So they went back to the tree and they put a plaque on the tree talking about how what had happened there was so important. And that's when they named it Liberty Tree. And they took the term liberty and adopted it as their main battle cry. Not, you know, we don't want to pay taxes, but liberty after that, other towns in the North American colonies began to designate their own liberty trees. The one in Boston was a very big elm. The one in Charleston, South Carolina was a live oak. The one in Braintree, Massachusetts was a buttonwood. But these were all prominent trees that got the name liberty tree as the local symbol of traditional liberties and resistance to Parliament's new taxation. As time went on, Liberty Tree became more than just a tree or a set of trees. It became a metaphor, the idea of flowering, of growing, of spreading naturally. 
after the American Revolutionary War, when Liberty Tree was an early casualty of the tree. It was chopped down in August or September of 1775. But the metaphor of Liberty Tree was transferred to the French Revolution, to Irish revolutions. It exists today as the idea of a natural, flowering, spreading liberty. John, you've in many ways already set the scene for us. We have Boston, it's a peninsula, we have Parliament, they've passed the Stamp Act, and we have Liberty Tree. Would you tell us how the Stamp Act riots get started? Okay, it was a Thursday, and Thursdays were market days in Boston, which meant that the farmers were bringing in their crops. Thursdays were also a day that the schools let out early. So we often see protests happening on Thursday. This particular Thursday, August 14, 1765, was a couple of months before the Stamp Act was supposed to take effect. People coming into town were greeted with a sight of effigies hanging off Liberty Tree. The effigies were a dummy of a man who was representing the stamp master of Boston. He had the initials A.O. on his pin to the coat, so it was impossible to mistake that this was a representation of Andrew Oliver, the man who had gotten the job of selling the stamped paper in Boston. There was another effigy of a boot with a devil sticking out of its head at the top, and this was supposed to represent Lord Bute, the former British Prime Minister a Scotsman close to George III who was getting blame for uh, all the policies that Americans didn't like, even though he had been out of office for years. And then there were crowds there who sort of good-naturedly stopped the farmers coming in and stamped their goods. And this was a way of conveying the idea that the Stamp Act could theoretically affect everybody. It was only a tax on the public use of paper, so publications, law uh, filings, that sort of thing. Those all had to be done on paper, which uh, had a stamp on it showing that somebody had paid the tax to the British government. But by sort of expanding that idea and stamping everything, the crowd outside uh, or underneath what became Liberty Tree was telling the farmers, was telling the other passers-by that this affects us all. By the afternoon, this you know, attracted quite a crowd. The sheriff of Suffolk County was told to go and take down the effigies. When he arrived, he was told that this would not be a good idea at all, and he didn't do it. As I said, the schools let out, and one witness describes 200 or 300 little boys marching around behind a flag that says, King, Pitt, and Liberty, about the king, William Pitt, and Liberty, the things that good American Whigs were supposed to be proud of. So that it was quite a spectacle, and it was something new in American politics. It was a protest of something that was coming up because the Stamp Act had not yet taken place. As darkness fell, the crowd became a little more restive and a little more violent. The idea of the the effigies that were hung on the tree had a lot in common with the effigies that Boston's youth paraded around town every 5th of November. They would parade on it with big floats containing an effigy of the Pope, the devil, and whatever political enemy of the day might be. Uh, often the Stuart pretenders to the throne, uh, once Admiral Bing, who had failed uh, badly in the French and Indian War. And in this case, people looking at these effigies would have probably been immediately reminded of the effigies from the 5th of November. And what happened at the end of the 5th of November? Well, all the effigies were taken and burned publicly in a great bonfire, and this was part of the fun. So I think there was a natural assumption in the crowd that, oh, now we have these effigies against the Stamp Act, let's go burn them too. The crowd took the effigies, laid them out on a board, went to visit Andrew Oliver's place of business, a small building that was under construction at his wharf, which was thought to be where he would be storing and selling out, doling out the stamped paper. And they tore that to the ground. They went to his house and they tore his fence down. They even grabbed his carriage, although some gentlemen stopped them and said, no, we shouldn't, no, don't go too far. But they carried 
the wood from his office and the wood from his fence and the effigies up to the nearby Fort Hill and had their big bonfire. So that was the first Stamp Act riot. The town was continued to be restive for the next couple of weeks, and then spontaneously, without the organization that had taken place before that August 14th demonstration, there was an attack on three officials' houses on the 26th, and the most extreme of those attacks was on the house of Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson in the North End. And Hutchinson, although he had protested against the Stamp Act when Parliament first brought up the idea, and he had said, no, this is not a good idea, he was nevertheless seen as, and rightly so, as a supporter of the royal government in principle, as a person who felt that protests of this sort were not good. He was related by marriage to Andrew Oliver. So he really embodied a sort of top-down approach to Massachusetts politics, and he had developed a great unpopularity, clearly, because people sacked his house and tore apart his belongings and his furniture and his clothing and his plates and chinaware and drove him and his daughter and other relatives out of the house. They had to seek refuge with relatives. And then they spent the entire night. This was It was a spontaneous event, but it was not just a short-lived. They, the crowd spent hours there trying to pull apart the whole house. So it was left just as a, an empty skeleton. And that was the height of the violence against the Stamp Act in Boston. And that was what the political leaders of the town began to pull back against. Wow. The Stamp Act inspired two separate days of rioting. Do we know, you mentioned that the second day of rioting was spontaneous. Do we know if the first day of rioting was organized by a particular person or a particular group? It looks very much like the effigies were put together by a group that called themselves the Loyal Nine. They were a small group of young businessmen, some of them merchants, more of them sort of your top level of mechanics or craftsmen in the south end of Boston. Two or three of them were distillers, so they had already been keyed off by the Sugar Act on these issues, and they met in a distillery on that corner or near that corner where Liberty Tree stood. The tree actually stood in the yard of a bookseller who was not part of this group, and uh, periodically he would sort of mention that perhaps they would like to have their protest somewhere else, and they would say, no, we kind of like it here. Okay. Okay. That group, the Loyal Nine, we know from a couple of letters that they sent to relatives, i.e. people they could trust very closely, they were involved in organizing later protests along the same lines in Boston. We know that at one point, uh, one of their number, a man named Thomas Crafts, actually went out and removed an effigy from Liberty Tree because it had not been authorized by this group. And he was one of the only nine people who had the authority to do that. So they had a lot of unofficial authority within Boston to put these together. In their letters, they talk about getting together and deciding, planning what to do and having the placards and handbills printed and distributing them around town. So we, we know that they were involved in, in this organization. They do not seem to be connected to the later riot against Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson's house. Earlier, you mentioned that one of the effigies was hung with an AO for Andrew Oliver, the stamp distributor. How did Andrew Oliver get the stamp distributor job, and did the mob ever go after him personally? We know that they went after his stamp act shack, but did they ever go after Oliver personally? He probably got his job. He was, I believe at that time, he was already the royal secretary of the province, which was like the number three position within the royally appointed government, uh, appointed from London. He uh, was a merchant of good standing, and as I say, he was connected by marriage to Thomas Hutchinson. So he seemed like a trustworthy person from the British point of view, and as stamp agent, he would keep some of the revenue that he collected. This was an investment on his part. So there were probably people angling for this job in every colony, and he just happened to have the right connections, which is the way the patronage system worked. As to whether people went after him personally, it's a very interesting dynamic within the Boston riots that there's a lot of threatening of gentlemen, but rarely is there a physical attack on a man of that class. When they start to 
tar and feather men later in 1769 and on, it's always working class men who get that treatment or men who are sort of on the verge of gentility. Andrew Oliver was clearly a gentleman, so there was no physical attack on him, but there was the threat of one. There was, in December 1765, a rumor went around that he had, after promising to resign as stamp agent, he hadn't actually resigned or hadn't totally gone through with it or something. And the Loyal Nine put out their handbills and said, we're going to hear this man resign in public. And they sent a large crowd to his house. And it was a rainy day in December in Boston, cold and wet. And still, he got the message and he went out to Liberty Tree in front of this crowd and he repeated that he was resigning. And clearly the crowd was intimidating him into doing this. Do you know why or do historians know why Thomas Hutchinson took the stance that he did. I mean, he was not a fan of the Stamp Act, and yet he took a strong stance that he would enforce it. I think it was a matter of principle for him. He genuinely believed in the British government. He genuinely believed in a certain level of top-down politics. He had made a name for himself in Massachusetts politics several years earlier in arguing for a tighter monetary policy. And in doing so, sort of put himself into the camp of what was then called the court policy or the court party, which were people who felt that there should be more centralized, top-down government. It was partly a matter of temperament, partly a matter of economic interest, especially later when it came to the Tea Party. But I think genuinely he was principled in believing that Massachusetts did owe some obedience to Parliament in London, even if Massachusetts people were not able to vote for anybody in Parliament. Now that we know how the Boston Stamp Act riots played out and the people involved, we should explore their impact. Did the Boston Stamp Act riots inspire other colonial communities to protest the act? Definitely. The Boston riots, especially that first one on the 14th, they provided the template for demonstrations in New Hampshire, in Rhode Island, in Connecticut, in Pennsylvania, in Charleston. The idea, this combination of a public protest, often with effigies, with processions and parades, combined with the threat of violence at night or in the daytime, was repeated over and over along the North American coast. In fact, even up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which of course never joined in the American Revolution and the independence movement at that time, they had stamp protests of this same sort. How important were the Stamp Acts, do you think, in the way the American Revolution would move forward in Boston? I think they were very important, both in Massachusetts and a continent-wide, because of a couple of things. One is that the unlike the Sugar Act, and unlike many of the Townsend duties that followed in 1767, the, the Stamp Act really affected a great large swath of the population, because they involved newspapers and broadsides, they were something that every literate person would end up paying part of the costs of. And then they involved a legal filing. So if you wanted to collect debts or defend yourself against debts, which is a big thing in the colonial economy, then you had to be paying the stamp tax every time you filed a new piece of paper. So the Stamp Act was, from a strategic point of view of the imperial government, it was a way of spreading out the costs of administration very widely among the people involved in public discourse, and that seemed fair, but it also meant that you got the widest number of people upset at this new tax, whereas with the Sugar Act, it was just one industry, and you could say that was a special interest. Here, everybody got upset at once. So that's why a lot of historians date the coming of the American Revolution, the start of that political conflict from the Stamp Act of 1765. Another way that the Stamp Act and that protest were very important is that over the course of 1765, the protest sort of got out ahead of the law enough that when the date came around, November 1st, for the law to take effect, most stamp agents were already intimidated and simply didn't not open for business. 
most colonial courts were intimidated or decided to go ahead without requiring all the filings to be on stamped paper. Newspapers continued to publish, book publishers continued to publish, and so on, so that it never actually took effect in the colonies. And then, because of a change of government in London, in early 1766, the Parliament decided to repeal the Stamp Act and look for another way to raise revenue in the North American colonies. And that put in place this cycle of Parliament instituting attacks, big protests in the colonies, boycotts, uh, riots, demonstrations, and eventually Parliament backs down. And that seems to happen again with the Townsend duties. And so I think that left the North American colonists expecting the same thing to happen again with the Tea Act, and then maybe again with the sending troops to Boston, so that the North Americans kept feeling that if they just hung together and protested loudly enough and boycotted strongly enough, then they could get their way. And they were not looking for independence or a war. They were looking for Parliament to back down again. Clearly, the Boston Stamp Act riots were an important event in the American Revolution. For those of us who like to travel and go see history, could you recommend some sites in Boston that we could see that would help give us a feel for the Stamp Act and the Stamp Act riots? It would be nice. Unfortunately, the, the most important sites in that, in those events, are no longer extant. The Liberty Tree was chopped down, as I said, in the uh, summer of 1775 when Boston was under siege and the the British army and loyalists held the city and they chopped it down for firewood. The site of Liberty Tree was is now something called Liberty Tree Park in Boston. Uh, there is a plaque and a sort of bas relief up on a a wall, but it's in the middle of a fairly urban neighborhood. Uh, In fact, when I was growing up, it was in the neighborhood that got the name the Combat Zone because it was Boston's red light district, and therefore it was not really suitable for tourists. Nowadays, the neighborhood is being rejuvenated. There is some thought to remaking that site and the park more visible, but as I understand it, the open space is crisscrossed underneath with utility lines of various sorts. So it would be actually difficult to plant a very large tree there uh, as a replacement for the for Liberty Tree. But Liberty Tree Park is one place people can see where those demonstrations took place. Then in the north end, there is the site of Thomas Hutchinson's house. That The house itself is long gone. There is a plaque there as well. And it shows at the bas relief showing the what the house looked like and how grand it was. And it's important to know that the North End at the time did not have that many grand houses. It was a working class neighborhood for the most part. So Thomas Hutchinson was living in the middle of people who were not nearly as rich as he was. And in between those two, there is the what was then in 1765 called the Townhouse is now the Old State House Museum, which was the seat of government on the town government and the provincial government. The riots of August 26th began with bonfires in the street around the townhouse and then moved to the North End and Thomas Hutchinson's house. So that building, the Old State House, has been there since 1713. It was clearly part of the overall political struggles of the revolutionary period. So that's one thing people can see that was really there and connected with the Stamp Act. On August 14th, a group that I'm working with called Revolution 250 is sponsoring a commemoration of the very first Stamp Act protest at Liberty Tree Park. And uh, that will be open to the public. And the following day, the Bostonian Society, which runs the Old State House Museum, is sponsoring a reenactment of the more raucous parts of the protests, where I don't think they're actually going to tear down any buildings, but there will be people parading around with effigies. For those of us who like to read about history, could you suggest any good books about the Stamp Act riots in Boston? I was thinking about this, and I think uh, what I'd like to recommend is Al Young's book, Liberty Tree, which is about the popular protests throughout the revolution, but especially around Liberty Tree, which Uh, although it got its name during the Stamp Act protest, continued to be the site for political protest 
for the next 10 years. So that was where the people out of doors, as the phrase goes, would gather to demonstrate their opposition to something that would be the site of where funeral protests, funerals uh, would stop at Liberty Tree, the processions, if effigies would hang there, and so on. And Alfred Young's book, Liberty Tree, looks at not just Boston's Liberty Tree, but the idea of Liberty Tree over the years. And we'll include a link to Al Young's book in the show notes page for this episode. John, let's move into this time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. John, in your opinion, what might have happened if the Loyal Nine had not hung effigies in Liberty Tree? Do you think Bostonians would still have violently protested the Stamp Act? That's an interesting question. And of course, I can't know for sure, but my bet is that things would have gone differently because I can't think of another protest, colonial political protest, which was as far-sighted as sort of proactive as that first Stamp Act protest. They were protesting a law that had not yet taken effect. Nobody had actually had to pay the stamp tax yet, and yet they were making a very public demonstration. Uh, There was not really a tradition of that sort of public demonstrations against a government act. There were lots of ways to publicly demonstrate your loyalty to the government with parades and militia drills and fireworks on the king's birthday and things like that. But to complain about the government was still seen as potentially seditious. So by coming out and doing that, the Loyal Nine and the many people, the 200 and 300 boys, the crowds of farmers and others who participated in the event, they were doing something new and As I said, it set the model for similar protests in other American towns. And as a result, when the law was supposed to take effect, it couldn't. If there had been no protest movement of that sort up and down the coast, then I think probably the law would have taken effect and it would have been much harder to claim that this protest movement was a success. Before we conclude, John, would you give us a sneak peek of maybe some of the posts you're working on for Boston1775.net or some insight into any larger projects you might be working on? Well, I'm supposed to be writing this book about the beginning of the American Revolutionary War in April 1775, which traces the reason the British Army went to Concord to events the previous September, starting with what's called the Powder Alarm, and then an arms race in New England from September through December 1774, with both sides trying to grab as many cannon and other pieces of artillery as they could. And I think that's why the British ended up in Concord in April 1775, looking for cannon. So that's my big project. When Stamp Act anniversaries come around. I'm going to be highlighting those in the blog on those anniversaries. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this Revolution 250 project. And then often things will just come up, bits in the news, advertisements I've stumbled across in my research, and I'll just decide that, you know, that's what I want to write about uh, on the blog today. Or I usually write a day or two ahead. So that's what I want to write about on the blog on Saturday. You really wait for Cleo, the muse of history, to inspire you, don't you? It would be nice if Cleo came around more often, but yeah. (laughs) Where is the best place to look for more information about you and how to get in contact with you? The blog at boston1775.net has a link for contacting me and then to my Twitter feed at Boston1775 and uh, my Facebook page, also named Boston1775. John, thank you so much for taking us through the Boston Stamp Act riots and helping us celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act. Thank you, Liz. And I want to put in also a good word for the word sesterscentennial, which means 250th anniversary. We are going into the sesterscentennial of the American Revolution. I've gotten from the bicentennial to the sesterscentennial, and I don't really expect to get to the tercentennial, so I'm going to enjoy this one as much as I can. I'm sure you picked up on this. 
But John is a walking encyclopedia of Boston history, and I'm really excited we had the opportunity to chat with him about the Stamp Act riots. One aspect of the American Revolution that we often forget is how scary these riots and other forms of protests could be. As John revealed, the people of Boston made serious threats against Andrew Oliver and Thomas Hutchinson, and though they didn't cross the line and tar and feather them, angry Bostonians destroyed their homes and their property. I don't know about you, but that's scary for me. The American Revolution really was a great event in the history of the United States, but it must have been a terrifying one for many of our forebearers who lived through it. You can find more information about John, his always interesting blog, Boston1775.net, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash stamp act. Please remember to tell your friends and family members about Ben Franklin's World. Word of mouth recommendations are still the best way for new listeners to find us. You can send interested persons to benfranklinsworld.com or have them text BF World to 33444 for more information. Finally, where do you think we should host a future Ben Franklin's World meetup? Send me your thoughts to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, post a comment to the show notes page for this episode or in Poor Richard's Club, or tweet me at Liz Kovart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.